All right, well, let's get started this morning. Um, the title that I have for you, and I'm going to try to illustrate, is uh, It's a Wonderful Life, with the uh, subtitle of Responding to His Call. Responding to His Call. Now, some of you, probably, probably very few of you, uh, during this very lesson uh, are going to be faced with a situation. What's probably going to happen, like I said, this will be the fewer of you, but what might happen is your phone is going to ring or will buzz lowly, uh, depending on how you have it set, um, and you are going to have to decide, do I respond to this call? Do, do I answer this call right now? Now, more of you, if not most of you, if not all of you, in some manner, are going to receive a text during this lesson. Uh, and you are going to have to decide, uh, do I respond to this message? Do I respond to this text? Now, the sad part is the reason that more of us will receive texts and or send texts is because you can get away with it. Uh, that, that's really what it, I mean, not to imply that we are not all honest Christians here, but um, that you can get away with it. And so really the decision is going to be, depending on the rules of your, that you've set upon yourself or upon your kids or whoever about texting during spiritual time, is you're going to decide, can I type with one hand, look out of the corner of my eye and still seem like I'm diligently listening? Uh, and, and I've been really thankful for those quick messages that just say, like, okay. You know, you can just go down and say, okay. Or, I mean, I've had to say sometimes, like, end a study, send, you know, and, like, just don't answer them. Now, what's awesome is, uh, is that our older ladies, when they try to get away with this, because uh, this isn't just a, a young people problem now. This is an everybody problem. But what's great is when my older ladies try to get away with it, I mean, they have to hold their phone, like, way out here, and they adjust their glasses, and they're just like... <laughs> And I'll ask them, Margaret, are you texting right now? <laughs> it's just like, and then, so here's what I've gotten, believe it or not. She'll say, well, I invited my friend to church and I'm just giving her directions. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't even get mad at her. Uh, or even worse, I've gotten this one. She'd say, I'm trying to hit the little first John button so I can follow along. <laughs> like, ugh, like, I was going to chastise you, but now I look like the preacher meanie. All right. Now, so I tell her, you're, you're, you're forgiven. All right, let's uh, move on. But so the truth is, because of the rate and the frequency um, of communication in this, you know, cell, cellular age, cell phone age at least, in our digital age, because we have a lot of lines of communication that happen all the time, we are pretty unashamedly choosy about what calls we respond to. Uh, and, th and this is very reasonable because we have a lot of information coming and going. And because I can just say, okay, sure, talk to you later, in just a millisecond, we're pretty choosy about what calls we respond to. And so, you know, your phone is ringing, and you look at that screen, and you give it that, oh, not again, face, right? And you are, you're seeing who's calling you, and you are saying in your mind, and a lot of times with your face to everybody else, there is no reason for me to answer this call right now. Um, the thing that I always get a little bit... Uh, I don't know, I feel a little self-conscious about, is when I am meeting with somebody and maybe they have texted me or called me and so we're getting together to study and maybe during the study, you know, my phone buzzes and, you know, I mean, if it's appropriate and I don't interrupt things that are deeply, deeply important, of course, but if it's buzzing and we're talking and I like take a look at it and then I put it back in there just to see who it was, I'm wondering in my mind, is that person thinking, how many times has he done this to me? How many times has he gotten my call, looked at the little screen and said, nope, not important. <laughs> like, ignore, you know, go to voicemail. And I kind of want to look at it and say, I've never done this to you. You know, I, I always answer your calls, all right? I just want to kind of save some preacher face. Not that we have to do that, but uh, I feel like I need to. And so we are used to turning calls away. We are used to not listening to calls, ignoring them, sending them to the voicemail, checking the messages later. Now, we're used to that. Now, I also remember as a kid, um, you know, and Carrie's right. I mean, I've been around a few years. And, and so I remember as a kid, I mean, I, I grew up in the 80s. That's really when I was, you know, that was my childhood. That, I was an 80s, 80s child. Um, and I remember as a kid when the phone rang, you answered it. Now, there's a couple reasons for that. Um, and I remember distinctly that on our countertop, we had a white rotary phone and kind of a yellowish cream colored, 70s colored rotary phone. Um, you know, and they're the ones with the rotary on it, which half of you won't know what that is, but it's, it, you know, this thing that you dial. Uh, my kids have seen one before, and they said, how does that even work? And so we had, to, we had to explain. They're like, if you want a zero, how do you get a zero? And I'm like, well, you put your finger in the zero, and you go all the way around. And they're like, well, how does it know the difference between a zero and a nine? <laughs> it's just, it's magic. It just knows, all right? It just knows. 
And so we taught them how to use a rotary phone. They've never seen one since. But whenever you, that thing would ring uh, inside there, you know, it's just a bell with a little hammer. You know, the brrrr, you know, it's just loud. And, and I mean, you, you have to answer it for that reason. But the, the main reason that you had to answer it in the 80s and, you know, back to the 50s um, is because this was before phones told you who was calling. I mean, there was no screen on it. You had no idea. That thing would just ring. Now, I always loved being at my grandma Hooper's because sometimes the phone would ring and she would say, that sounds like a, uh, an urgent ring. And we're like, grandma, the ring is no different. If it's an urgent ring or a normal ring, you're going to have to answer it to find out who it is. But she, and so every time the phone would ring as little kids, we would be like, is this an urgent ring or not? And they're like, it's, it's, a, it's a hammer hitting a bell. You're just going to have to answer it. So, and I also looked it up last night, just out of curiosity. It, 1989 is when caller ID became mainstream. 1989. Now, back east, there were some counties that had caller ID a little bit earlier, but it wasn't until 1989 that most of us started getting phones with a little uh, green digital readout there that would give you a phone number, okay? And so we had to answer the phone because we didn't know who it was. But secondly, another reason that we would always answer it is that people didn't, again, communicate by phone all the time. You just didn't call all the time. I mean, think about how often, I mean, how many phone calls are you gonna make today? Like, hey, you guys going to ice cream? Hey, you going to Camp Richardson? Hey, when, when are we having lunch? You are gonna call multiple times today, uh, most likely. Again, there might be some of you like, oh, I'm not gonna waste my time with that, I'm camping. Uh, but it's okay because your kids are gonna text or call and get you covered anyway. Um, but could you even imagine, folks, could you even imagine trying to apply the phone calls, the hammer on the bell, the no caller ID phone calls of the 50s to the 80s. Imagine trying to find the equivalent of that with our modern texting, tweeting, Facebook posting, Instagramming culture. I mean, can you imagine, you know, the phone, you know, king, 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 hello, at the lake with friends, click. And you're like, who is that? <laughs> I think it was Margaret, and she just tweeted that she was at the lake with her friends. It's like, Okay. See, we are used to just these blurbs of information. We don't even want to talk. I mean, I don't even respond to everybody's Facebook pictures they put up. I mean, you're lucky if you're going to get a like from me, right? I don't even respond. And not that I don't like you. It's just I'm, I just don't feel compelled to respond to every single piece of information that flies up in front of me. I just don't feel compelled to do that. But when that hammer hit that bell at my grandma's house, we were all running for the phone. We were all running for the phone because it just didn't happen very often. And so you see here, what I'm bringing this to, guys, is that there is some correlation, there is some connection between how much information we get from others and how much information we are going to pay attention to. And right now, the scale kind of seems to be the more information we get from others, the less I feel like I need to pay attention to it. That's just the fact. I just... I mean, I get the information, I see the photos, I see the answer, I get all that stuff, I get the text, but it's a lot of times like, okay, well, aren't you going to respond or answer? I don't need to. Why? Because we get messages all the time. Crazy how that's happened. The more information, the less we listen to it. I mean, imagine, guys, if a person had not spoken a word their whole life, and at 46 years of age, they finally said hello. Everybody would hear that. I mean, it'd be on the news, it'd be talked about in the families, it would be on blogs, people would tweet about it, right? We would all talk about that. But now imagine if somebody talked and talked and talked every second and then suddenly they kept talking, I would still hear none of it, pretty much, right? And it's like, well, you talk all the time. Uh, I'll catch it later. The more information, the less I pay attention to it. Now imagine, imagine church, imagine the ear of God. Imagine the ear of the Lord. Imagine how much information he has received over the span of humanity. I mean, from the garden till now. I mean, he has information and requests and crying out and, I mean, for just millenniums, right? Millenniums he's heard this stuff. He's been hearing it since the beginning. And with the amount of information that he receives and has received, it would seem reasonable to, reasonable to me and almost even excusable that he would pay attention to very little of it. And I mean, this is just anthropomorphizing God. I mean, this is me making him a human listening to a bunch of phone calls, right? And I know that's not the situation, and we'll look at that. But it seems to me reasonable that God gets tons and tons and tons of information. And it seems like he would say, you know what, just inbox it, file it. 
I'll get back to that, right? I'll get to it later. I've heard this from you multiple times. Um, so if you would, let's go ahead and get into our text this morning. We'll illustrate this a bit. So turn on your Bibles and scroll down to 1 Kings chapter 18. We might as well just keep consistent <laughs> with what we're talking about here today. I know, I know some of you are going to do it. and I don't want to get in trouble with Margaret. 1 Kings chapter 18. I'm going to go ahead and start in verse 19, um, and we're, we, you know, this is a story you've probably heard many times, but we're just going to look at here, um, Mount Carmel here, where Elijah's going to face off with the prophets, but we're, going to, it, we're just going to look at a section of it here to illustrate uh, what we're talking about this morning. Verse 19, it says, Now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Now this is a really powerful statement that Elijah makes here for, for several reasons. Um, the one that I want to start with here is at the end of verse 21. He says, look, if the Lord is God, follow him. If it's Baal, follow him. Now that is interesting, folks. And I just... I've said this to our congregation a few times. I've even said this more to my kids. Um, I am not opposed uh, to, you know, prohibitions and abstinences and things of like, hey, watch out for this or stay away from this or boycott that store or don't watch that movie or whatever. I got no problem with that. And especially when it comes to people's consciences, when they're just like, hey, I just, I'm sorry, but I cannot buy that book or I just cannot approve of this. And, and that's fine. That's great. But I want you to see here, I want you to notice something that um, I think really supersedes that, and I think it's what we believe when we say those things, that, folks, I, I, am, I am not afraid of my kids visiting a Buddhist temple. I'm not worried about it, right? I mean, I'm just not worried about it. And, and what I've told my kids is I'm just like, you know what? Jesus is Lord. He got it from the dead, and if Buddha proves to you that he got it from the dead, follow him. I am not afraid of my kids somehow discovering what I peeled and searched and tried to figure out and didn't find that somehow Buddha outdoes Jesus in evidence in some way. You know, because he, he doesn't. Amen. I mean, there is no evidence out there other than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I honestly could care less what other temples or gods or goddesses they hear about or what religious sites they visit. I'm not afraid of them going into a Buddhist temple and coming out Buddhist. Because honestly, if that were to happen, um, they would be so shallow, I would just have to make fun of them. Uh, I, I would just say, son, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like, okay, what did it teach you when you went and saw that big gold smiling statue? Uh, what did that teach you? What did you learn on that? I mean, nothing. I mean, honestly, when we shift our religious positions, it is not because there was better evidence. It's because we had cultural pressure, period. That's it. There was no evidence away that would take you away from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is totally cultural pressure. That is the only reason. I mean, right now, why is anybody afraid to say homosexuality is a sin? Why is anybody afraid to say that? Is it because we somehow discovered that the Bible has been wrong this whole time? No. It's because of cultural pressure. That's the only reason. <laughs> it is cultural pressure. And again, and that's why I would say at the same time, I am all for not coming off like some gay bashing, violent psycho. Folks, that is not your savior. Never has been. I mean, he said prostitutes, pimps, lepers, come to me and let's talk. He invited them to talk. That's what I want. That's, I want the conversation. I want to prove, I want to give the evidence that Buddha loves them none, that Buddha doesn't exist, that Buddha is a smiling statue who has nothing to lose, and I want to show them a tortured Savior hanging on a cross and said, he did that for you. Buddha says, everything's fine. Smile and be surrounded with votive gifts. Jesus says, put me on a cross, and I will die for your sin. I don't care if it's homosexuality or lying. I will die for you. That's what I want people to know. That's what I want them to see. And so here we have uh, Elijah calling them and saying, do not hesitate. If Baal is God, go for it. And I feel like, don't, Elijah, <laughs> don't, don't say that. What if, they, what if they cross over? What if they go and join Baal's church? And you know what? He would say, let them have it. Let them have it. I mean, how many times did Jesus turn to people and say, you know what, if you want to follow me, put your hand to the plowshare and don't look back or you might as well not follow me. Oh, man, like, Jesus, you are not going to fill church buildings with that message, brother. Like, you, don't make it sound so hard. <laughs> like, just tell them, come one, come all, right? 
Jesus was not afraid of the evidence and neither was Elijah. It is true and it is real. And he says, don't hesitate. The other thing about hesitation that is really bad, it's a principle that's so common and so deadly. Uh, this principle kills squirrels on a daily basis. All right, because if you hesitate, right? I mean, when you're driving down the road and what's that little gray squirrel do? He runs mostly across the road. He like gets all the way across. You got it. He gets all the way across. He comes back to the middle. He goes back. He goes back. He gets back to the middle. And all the time I'm approaching him, sometimes I'm slowing down. Sometimes I'm not, all right? I'm just like, it doesn't even matter. Just go. Uh, and, and, you know, he's going to decide or he's going to hesitate. And so he gets in the middle and then they stop. And I, I literally have seen a squirrel go all the way to the other side. And I'm just like, oh, thank you. And then right then, just no. And he goes running back across it right under my wheel. And bada bump. And I'm like, well... Sorry, Israel, don't hesitate, right? I don't know what to tell you. I mean, if you're going to go back and forth in the middle of the road, and, and I was taught by my father, and I've always appreciated this lesson, he said, son, I don't care what animal runs out in the road, don't swerve. He said, because you will run off the road and kill your whole family, and Bambi will prance off and not even know that you existed. I'm like, that's right. I mean, I love animals, but my motto is kill them all if they're in the road. All right, kill them all. But on a lighter note, all right, what he's saying here is don't hesitate. All right, don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Make a decision because really, and you also see this principle. We all know, you know, the lukewarm water, the hot or cold. We understand this principle of God. We'll get that very harshly in Revelation. Really, what is God mad about? He's mad about the hesitation. He's mad about being in the middle. He's like, be hot or cold. And really what he's saying there in that, in that example is be good or evil. Because the good ones I can bring to heaven, the evil ones, you're separate me forever. The lukewarm ones, I'm just mad at you. You know, he's just, he's just angry. Don't be lukewarm. Make a decision, all right? And so he says, don't hesitate. Now, verse 22, then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give, to, give us two oxen and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up, place it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood. And I will put fire under it. And poor guy, he's got to do this all by himself. They got 400 helpers. Verse 24, then you call in the name of your God. I will call in the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. He is God. And all the people answered and said, that's a good idea. And I think, man, it's like a bunch of rednecks playing with fireworks, right? Like... <laughs> Whatever God answers by fire, he's God. Why does it have to be fire? <laughs> Why can't, I mean, I think I would say whatever God answers by bacon, you know, he is God. Uh, well, I mean, they're Israelites, so that wouldn't work. Uh, whatever, whatever God answers by chocolate cake, all right? All, I guess all I'm saying is it seems weird to play with fire on a divine level, right? Whichever God explodes things with fire, it's like, man, you are not talking about kids with matches. You're talking about a creator who can undo your DNA, all right? Don't, don't tempt him with fiery displays please but all the people are like yeah do it and like, all right well let's do it verse 25 so elijah said to the prophets of baal choose one ox for yourself prepare it for you or many for prepare it first call the name of your god but put no fire under it and they took the ox which was given to them they prepared it called in the name of baal from morning until noon saying oh baal answer us but there was no voice no one answered and they leapt about the altar which they had made I think at this part, I always, uh, I always feel like I can't criticize these poor guys for their involvement. I mean, they are very committed at the very least, um, which, you know, I would say too, and I know that we've tried to be good about that in the brotherhood, and I know we're getting even better about that, is that we're not, you know, we're not criticizing anybody's passion or anybody's sincerity. You know, when I talk about someone teaching false doctrine or misrepresenting the scripture or taking something out of context... I'm not questioning their sincerity. There's a lot of good-hearted people out there who just haven't heard or just don't obey some of these verses. And, and I've been there, all right? That's been me, and I was a good person. Uh, I, I liked myself, and I, I meant well. But there's lots of times where I misunderstood and, and took things out of context for sure. And so I'm not even criticizing their involvement or their heart, but, man, they are, are worshiping and serving and calling on this God, even if it's Baal. And I want you to notice that this this requirement that they feel is one of action. That, that's what I would like to point out, is that even the idol worshipers get it, that our faith in whatever needs to be active. There's just not a God out there who's saying, sit home, do nothing, ignore me, ignore people, and just forget that I exist. Every God calls for action, and at least we get that display here, right? Then verse 27, it came about at noon that Elijah mocked him and said, call out with a loud voice, for he's a God. Uh, maybe he's occupied. 
Huh, maybe he's gone aside. Uh, some versions say maybe he's off track. Or he's on a journey. Or perhaps he's asleep and needs to be awakened. I'm like, man, Elijah, you're cold. I mean, he is just making fun of them while they're all dancing around and making a big to-do of it. And as comical as Elijah's comments may seem, this is really not a challenge uh, to, again, to their sincerity. This is a challenge to the human idea many people have about God. God is not a, is not a human. Okay, God is not a human. Um, in fact, I grabbed this quote because I remember reading it years ago in one of his books. Um, but Carl Sagan, kind of the noted author, professor, uh, astronomer, agnostic, he said this, he said, the idea that God is an oversized white male with a flowing beard who sits in the sky tallying the fall of every sparrow is ludicrous. And folks, we can amen that, right? I mean, not much Carl Sagan said I could amen, but I can amen that. God is not a big white guy in the sky, all right? He's not, never has been. Uh, he's not an old guy and he's not a guy for that matter. Otherwise, when I read scriptures like he made them male and female in his image, well, if he's a guy, how do he do that? Uh, that's a weird scientific combination. And so here God says, look, I'm not a man, right? I'm not a man. And so what's powerful about this is that the Bible does not teach that God is a human being. And so when people create a God in their image, he or she basically becomes a big human in the sky who they need to cut themselves and sacrifice things and yell out to and try to get their attention because he could be asleep. He could be on a journey. He could have made the earth and walked away. And how many criticisms have we received on that? That, oh yeah, God, I think he created the earth and then just went away. Went where? He's not a person. He didn't move to Florida. He's not on, in retirement or on vacation, all right? He's not a human. And so when they hear this in verse 28, they cry out with a loud voice and they cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. And it came about when midday was past, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. And here it is, guys, the saddest part of the verse, I believe. I think the, the part that makes me, I don't know, the most sad for them. But there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Nobody was listening to that. I, the God of heaven was listening to that. Amen. But nobody was listening to that. There was no bail to hear this. There was no bail listening. There was no bail going to respond to this because there's no bail. Nobody was listening. Nobody paid attention. And so let's just put it on the table here, folks, as Christians, as Jehovah followers here. When people feel like God is listening to them or not listening to them, when they feel like that God doesn't hear them, they get upset, they get mad, they get sad, they get frustrated, they get in despair. Um, and what are the requirements that we have of God um, to judge him a good listener. You know, in other words, if God isn't listening to them and they say, I have prayed to God, I have turned to God, I've been told to believe in God, I've done everything you're supposed to do for this God, and he hasn't done anything. You know, what are they asking for? He hasn't responded to me. He hasn't done anything for me. And again, I know as Christians, we're familiar with this. We're familiar with the responses from God of, you know, yes, no, maybe later. I mean, I know we're familiar with these concepts, but again, just putting it all on the table, are we able to relate to somebody who says, I have prayed to God forever and he hasn't done anything? Sure, I, I get it. What are they asking for, folks? What are they asking for? They are asking for action. They are asking for reaction. They want something to happen when they call upon the name of the Lord. They want something to happen. They want an answer. And they don't just want, pray more, read your Bible more. They're like, I've done that. I've done that. Well, you just need to pray a little bit more. Okay. But after I do, what should I expect? And it's tough, guys. It's tough. Because honestly, as a preacher, I feel like I only have very cop-out answers at times, which aren't cop-outs to me. It just feels like a cop-out when I tell somebody else, man, I just hang in there. I... Uh. <laughs> And I know what they're looking for, but here's where it's convicting. We want God to answer us. We want God to do something for us. We want God to respond to every message we send him, every text that we throw him. We want him to respond. We want him to respond right away. We do not want him to look at our screen and turn away. We do not want him to ignore us or send us to voicemail. We want him to respond to every message. And then we come to Luke 
646. And why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Man, that's a killer, isn't it? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Why don't you do what I say? I mean, oh man, he's right. If, if we want action from God, if we want response from God, if we want him to respond to every single text that we send him, why do I not respond to a single text many times that he sends me? And he sends me text after text after text after text. And instead of realizing the power and the promise of us responding to his text, right, to his call, instead of trusting that lives could be changed and a world could be altered by us listening to him and saying, I'm mad because you don't listen to me, instead of actually believing that he's Lord and doing what he says, it all gets traded in for clever arguments and circular reasoning that keeps me a safe distance from any kind of real commitment to this Jesus. He sends them over and over and over. And so I really do want Jesus to respond to every message I send him, but I want to doubt and question and call foul and avoid the texts that he has sent me. I just don't even want to hear him. And so what we're going to do this morning is I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and open your mind or, you know, or leave your eyes open and open your mind. And we are going to listen to some texts from God. And here's the thing. Uh, there's not going to be any commentary. There's not going to be any setup or breakdown of this. You are going to hear the voice of God. You're going to hear the voice of God. You are going to hear text after text after text from God. He is going to beep you and bleep you right now. And the question is, ah, how are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? And I'll ask, after our last, after our last text is received... Um, we're going to stand together, and we're going to be led in uh, We Will Glorify, which is song 738. So if you want to have 738 ready, um, we're going to do 738. After we receive the last text from God, 738, and we'll stand together and sing it. 738. So go and make followers of all people in the world. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I have taught you, and I will be you with you always, even until the end of this age. But go, and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call righteous, but sinners to repentance. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry, not in drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling blood or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unloved bread of sincerity and truth. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. So let us stop going over basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. If we live in the Spirit, let us 
us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another or envying one another. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience. <coughs> Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Beloved, and let us love one another, and for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Let us, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Let us stand.